So we've just spent two hours almost talking about the pain neuroscience. And we concluded here by saying how our approach to pain and injury is going to involve first addressing unhelpful thoughts and fears uh, as it relates to pain. So we need to assess those things. We need to ask people what are they thinking about, uh, what are they afraid of, and paying attention to how they're behaving so that we can address those kind of psychosocial variables. Additionally, we want to facilitate the best environment for healing. I've talked about that in the context of the biological factors. Say you have an acute injury with acute inflammation, things like that. So we, we, we're addressing all of these factors. We're addressing the psychological and the social variables. We're trying to assess the biological factors to create an optimal environment for healing. So, from a practical standpoint, if we're going to talk about the specific uh, activity modification prescription for folks who, have, who are dealing with, a, with an injury, most acute, this will cover most acute injuries and some types of more chronic things, but not all of them. Uh, particularly in barbell lifters, athletes like you all who will be training in the gym or who you might be coaching yourselves. So somebody complains of some, some sort of pain in the gym, what are we going to do about it? Well, first is reassurance, telling people to not freak out, right? Because freaking out is all those unhelpful thoughts and fears that we just spent a lot of time talking about. So reassurance, getting them to not freak out is really, really important. Just assess the situation real quick. Make sure there aren't any of those red flag signs that we've you know, talked about, something that's very concerning, which is extremely unlikely to happen, extremely unlikely to happen. And then we need to talk about how are we going to uh, move forward with, again, introducing movement in a non-threatening context. That was, our, that was our key, reintroducing movement in a non-threatening context. That means that we don't want to keep hammering movement patterns that increasingly piss off whatever is irritated. We want to desensitize things, not worsen the sensitization. So we want to desensitize them. So the first question, let's take an example of a lift. Let's say that you have some sort of pain when you squat. Let's say that it's back pain when you squat, or hip pain when you squat, or knee pain when you squat. Take your pick, whatever. <clears throat> the first question that we're going to ask is, well, is there a weight that you can use on the squat that does not hurt? <coughs> because I'll have people who come after this sort of thing all the time and they'll say, well, you know, I loaded up 225 and it hurt. It's like, you know there's like other options below 225, right? It's okay to go down if you have to. What happens if you squat 135? What happens if you squat 95? What happens with the empty bar, body weight? Is there a weight that you can move through that full range of motion with without pain? So that's the first, after reassurance, and assessment, load. Because if there is a weight you can squat through the full range of motion without pain, number one, that's super reassuring to me. It's like, cool, you can still do a squat, no real problem here. You're just sensitive to that movement above a certain load. So let's just take it down, see what happens. And then you just work your way back up the dose of stress on the way back up is probably going to vary from person to person, but I would start fairly conservatively. There's no need to smash someone with a ton of training volume just because the weight is light here, because then you can contribute to some other sort of new thing that develops if they're unadapted to that level of training volume, right? But if they can reduce the load and move through that full range of motion, you feel pretty darn good that they're going to be fine and get better and you know, uh, get back to normal activity in fairly short order. Let's say you take him down to 135, it hurts. You take him down to 95, it hurts. You take him down to the empty bar, it hurts. You do a body weight squat and say, nope, 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 nope. Every one of them hurts. Well, then my next question is, where does it hurt when you do it? I would probably ask, where does it hurt earlier in this sequence? But this is where that becomes relevant. So where does it hurt? They say, oh, it hurts, you know, right when I'm in the bottom, hitting depth. I'm like, oh, well, that's easy then. Let's just cut that part out. Because again, we don't want to increasingly sensitize them to it, hammering that part more and more. We want to desensitize them. So let's cut, get, cut them a little bit of a break from that so that they can train 
reduce whatever fear they're having every time they experience it. They don't learn to anticipate hurting every time they get a bounce out of a squat. Maybe it'll desensitize over time. So how do we do that with some, like, something like that? You just do like a pin squat, for example, or a box squat if you like box squats. Pins are usually a little easier to adjust so you don't have to have a ton of different boxes. Whatever your situation is to adjust that range of motion. We had uh, one of our attendees, what's your name again? Isaiah. Isaiah. He was having some shoulder pain. Uh, he was having some shoulder pain, particularly when he was starting out of the bottom of an overhead press. Every time he started out of the bottom of an overhead press, regardless of load. So what do you think the prescription has been? Pin press. That's what we're gonna start with. I'm trained the pin press a whole bunch. Then maybe next week or week after, lower the pins a little bit, lower the pins a little bit, lower the pins a little bit, pull the pins out. See if you can press without it. Okay? But that doesn't work every time. So there's two examples. Because what if they say, oh, it hurts throughout the entire range of motion. As soon as I start squatting or when I unrack and I'm standing there with my squat, it hurts. Or the entire press hurts or something like that. There's no range of motion you can cut out of that. Right? So you see how we're kind of moving as little as we can away from the parent lift. But if we can't use the parent lift with a reduced range of motion, then we kind of have to do something else now, right? You can't tell them, all right, just go home. No more training for you. We're going to adjust our exercise. Because you may be particularly sensitive to that specific exercise that you're doing. There may be, very likely is, to be an exercise variation that you can do that is not going to be, that you won't be as sensitive to. So when I gave the example of my wife tweaked her back, doing a low bar squat, every time she would unrack almost any weight with the lowest, she's like just grimacing. And I'm like, this is unproductive because you're feeling it every single time. It's getting worse as the load gets higher. Not any particular part of the range of motion. You're learning to anticipate it, very uncomfortable. Why don't we just move the bar up your back two inches? High bar squat. She was like, no pain. She was less sensitive to the high bar squat than she was to the low bar squat. That was a very lucky example. It was just minimal change, right? If the high bar squat was uncomfortable, what could we have done? Front squat. She may be less sensitive to that. Changes in the, all the different angles that your joints and body go through. What if front squat was uncomfortable? What could you do? Sorry? Belt squat. Yeah, particularly if it's back pain, right? Effectively unload the back segment and see if they can still belt squat. That would be an, that would be an example. What if the belt squat hurt? Now you have to start getting creative, probably leg press. But you see how this works. You can kind of think about, we talk about like the spectrum of exercise selection, exercise specificity, right? So all you need to do is just work your way backwards down that line of exercise specificity, going one step further away from the main lift until you find one they can tolerate. Train that for a little while, then jump up one run. So if she was able to train the front squat for a little while, felt good, what would be my next step to get her back to normal? Probably put high ball, yeah. Train that for, you know, if, if that goes great for a session, then maybe the next time I feel confident enough to just, hey, all right, let's go back to the main low bar squat you're doing. If she's like kind of in between, but it's tolerable, once she warms up, she feels better, I'm like, all right, let's stick with this for a little while. It's not doing anything magic, right? We're just finding things she can train, whoever the trainee is can train. And along the way, not only are we still training fairly productively, but we're also doing this. We're doing reassurance by continuing to train. They're learning that it's okay to keep moving, that it's okay to keep doing this movement pattern. They're becoming more confident. They are actually taking charge of their own symptoms, self-efficacy, autonomy. I'm not telling them, hey, you need to go get dry needle to get this fixed. You can take care of this yourself. You don't even need me, because now you know how to do this. You know what I mean? Questions about this kind of process? 
this is kind of the standard prescription that we're working down when we have most injuries in the gym. This generally works a lot of the time. There are some types of injuries that this won't necessarily work for. One of the more difficult ones that this will not always work for is a tendinopathy, particularly a more chronic tendinopathy will be more complex to, to manage. But again, remember, most acute things heal in a couple weeks. And so this might not even be doing anything in particular to facilitate healing. You may be healing on your own and we're just finding a way to continue training in the meantime. Regression to the mean, you know? Either way, training is better than not training. That's what we say, right? So do you always address load or range of motion? Like someone can uh, say do like uh, mid-shin rack pulls with basically the same weight. Would you still have them drop down to like 65 pound deficits if they're able to do, if that's what they need to do for a full range? I wouldn't say I always do anything okay. except the reassurance part. Yeah. So I would, on a case-by-case -case basis, I very well may, well, in the situation you describe, I would probably have them do both. Okay. Let's say we have them pull twice a week. If we want to reduce detraining as much as possible and they can continue doing a heavy rack pull, right. but if I wanted them to pull from the floor, they would have to take the weight way down, then another day, then I want them to pull from the floor still. Because the range of motion is a pro I want them to be moving through that range of motion. I don't want them to, you know, just get conditioned that, oh, this is the range of motion that hurts for me. You know what I mean? So I want them to access that range of motion if they can, which it sounds like they can. But if you want to minimize detraining and you want to get creative and keep a shorter range of motion part in the picture, yeah, you can do that too. Yeah, yeah, that's perfectly reasonable.